go inside the Crimson Tide. Tider Insider TV with Rodney Orr and Gary Harris. I don't care if it's effort that they give, toughness that they give, ability to focus and execute, however you want to break it down, then you know, if we have somebody else, we'll replace them. When you play football at Alabama, it's Nick Saban's way or it's the highway. Good evening, everybody, and welcome into Tider Insider TV presented by Buffalo Rock. Tonight we're enjoying ice cold Diet Pepsi, and I do mean it's ice cold. Too. It is. And that's the way we like it. Alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com. Remember, for the latest on the Crimson Tide 24-7, it's TiderInsider.com. Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Those comments Coach Saban made last Wednesday following the Tide's first scrimmage. Now, on Saturday, this past Saturday, it was spring scrimmage number two. Now, per standard operating procedure, video cameras not allowed to shoot the scrimmage, just the warm-ups, but the university did release these photos. Quarterback A.J. McCarron led the way, completing 19 of 40 for 255 and four touchdowns. Running back-wise, Trent Richardson was the leading ground gainer with 44 yards on 13 carries. He also had six catches for 27 yards. Receiving numbers were second uh, only to Darius Hanks, uh, Richardson's receiving numbers, second uh, only to uh, Darius Hanks because Richardson had six catches for 87. Hanks, six for 131 and three touchdowns. Let's take a look at uh, some of the other impressive performances. Phillip Sims right there as well. Actually a better percentage than A.J. And he did have a pick and one last touchdown. D. Hart proving again that he's a factor in that running back uh, race and might see some time at other positions as well on offense. Kind of a hybrid type player. Jalston Fowler, your power guy. You might see him down on the goal line. DeAndre White, speed to burn on the outside. Marquise Mays, a proven football player at wide receiver. So, Rodney, let's start with the offense. Coach Saban uh, was pleased after the first scrimmage with the offense. Even more pleased, it seemed like, with the second scrimmage, particularly both quarterbacks, Sims and McCarron. Coach continuing to have high praise for what they're getting done, not only in terms of their performance on the field, but also the leadership they're bringing to the football well, team. Well, you know, you talk about the stats. Gary and Nick Saban said those really don't mean anything at this point. And, and, and to kind of point that out, I think when you look at, like, the interception that Phillip Sims threw, supposedly, it was, a, it was a pass that was catchable, bounced off the receiver, was intercepted, returned for a touchdown. And so, I mean, those are the kind of things that you don't see in those statistics. A.J. McCarron, of course, uh, had some passes dropped as well. So, I think all in all, the quarterbacks did an outstanding job. It's the consistency of wide receiver that still has to continue to improve. You know, offensively, everybody wants to talk about the quarterbacks. It, it looks like two good, young, talented players there, but unproven. But there's some other areas where Alabama is going to need production. In the past, uh, Julio Jones was your go-to guy mm -hmm. at wide receiver. He's gone. We've talked about it. Uh, Carter coming in this summer could be a factor there, but right now he's not here in the spring. You've got Mays, you've got Hanks, DeAndre White putting up some numbers. What's that third receiving position looking like? Well, I think DeAndre White's got an opportunity, Gary. We've talked about him repeatedly, his speed, his ability to get deep. He's showing some consistency, uh, it seems, uh, this spring. So he, it'll be interesting to see how he continues to progress. And, of course, you have Kevin Norwood and some other guys, Kewan Malone and, and some other young guys, Kenny Bell who uh, did well in the first scrimmage. So, again, you know, it's going to be a, just kind of see how everything progresses. And I think, obviously, it's going to be Mays, Hanks, and then we'll see what happens with the other spot. And before we move to defense, real quickly, that left tackle position con continues to be a concern. And, and quite frankly, it looks like there's a battle there, but nobody has stepped up and, and taken the lead. Well, and I think, again, it's, it's early. And, and when you look at a guy that transfers in like uh, – uh, Aaron Douglas did at the left tackle spot, battling Alfred McCullough, of course. You know, it kind of takes some time, and I think uh, with the offseason program, Aaron Douglas is going to have an opportunity to get bigger, stronger, better acclimated with what he's doing in the Alabama system. And, and you know, then when you get to fall practice, Gary, I think we'll get that thing settled. Okay. Following scrimmage number one, Coach Saban happy with the offense. Happy with the offense again following scrimmage number two. Not so with the defense. Uh, scrimmage number one, he thought the tackling was poor. He really felt like they made a lot of improvement in scrimmage number two. We take a look at some of the numbers and all the usual suspects up there on the screen. Yeah, and, and you know, Gary, a lot of talk last year about how Dante Hightower was not the Dante Hightower we'd seen previous to the injury. You know, talking to people that actually saw the scrimmage, it, it seems like he's on the verge of being that guy again. He's, he's really starting to emerge, had a great scrimmage. 
and C.J. Mosley as well, some of those linebackers. Outstanding linebackers, the thing you want to talk about defensively, though, is they still have to settle things up front with the line. Yeah, Coach Saban, uh, I talked a bit about this on my sports at 6 o'clock, likes to play as many as seven guys. You know, I know they got three or four they real, feel really good about. Jesse Williams and Quentin Dial, a lot of talent, but, you know, they're learning the system. It's going to take them a little time. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you, Gary, you talked to some people that have been around years when you're talking about the junior college guys that just the opportunity to go through spring practice like Jesse Williams, Quentin Dial means so much to those guys. I mean, John Copeland, when he came in here, he was not a dominant player. It took him a while to develop. And uh, uh, Terrence Cody, of course, he came in and dominated right away. So you hope that Jesse Williams and Quentin Dial next fall can kind of merge pretty quickly. All right, good stuff. Coming up on TITV, Rodney will have his recruiting updates, including where Alabama stands with one of the top prospects for the class of 2013 in the entire country. And still to come, first it was the Tide, then the Tigers. But when signing day come, came, Brent Callaway inked with Bama. Now an Auburn internet reporter says there were recruiting violations with this prospect in regards to the Crimson Tide. We'll have the accusations and how Alabama has already checked into them and found nothing. And we'll be taking your phone calls and getting to your emails. There's the phone number to reach us, 205-348-9882, or you can email us at TITV at WVUATV.com. Stay tuned for more Tider Insider TV presented by Buffalo Rock. You stay with us. Welcome back to Tider Insider TV. Glad you're with us on this Tuesday night. It's uh, one of our most popular segments, recruiting update time with the main man, Rodney Orr. And Rodney, let's get right to it. A, a story that you've got on your site in regards to one of the top cornerback prospects in the country, Geno Smith. It's hard to say, you know, where he'll sign because there's still much time, so much time left until next February, but Alabama, very, very strong with him. Yeah, we talked to Geno. Obviously, you mentioned he's one of the top cornerback prospects in the country. He has offers from everybody, basically. And uh, he told us last Saturday night that Alabama, the strong leader right now. So that was the first mention, by the way, that Alabama was his strong leader. So, uh, you know, it's a long way to signing day, but that's certainly a good position to be in. You know, Alabama with uh, Sal Sanceri and, and, of course, some of their other coaches have done a great job of recruiting the Mid-Atlantic mm -hmm. area. Ronald Darby, another young man from Maryland, and he's a, he's a speedy cornerback yeah, as well. Yeah, 4-3-1, Gary, and prep All-American in track and has offers from all over the country, uh, just like Geno Smith does. He was supposed to come in on a visit. We talked to uh, Ronald last night. I talked to him, and he was supposed to come in on a visit Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. He text messaged me this morning, said that visit's off now for Alabama, but he's going to reschedule it. Alabama and Notre Dame and a few others are in the mix. He really hasn't narrowed down his choice, but I know he's extremely high on Nick Saban and the thought of playing, you know, for Nick Saban, who might be the best defensive backs coach in the country. Closer to home, a young man I called you back about yep. uh, early last season, Javier Mitchell from Leeds. Saw a little tape on him. He was playing on the defensive line, but just just whipping guys. I mean, reminds me a, a little bit, not quite as tall, but uh, the great player that came out of Woodlawn a few years ago that went to Auburn. Was nine, Dansby. Eight. Yeah, Carlos Dansby. That kind of athlete. He's going to get bigger. Uh, Auburn's been all over him, but Alabama has now offered, and this is a guy that's got, uh, got some physical twos, probably going to play linebacker in college. Javier goes by. Javier. Javier, okay, thanks for correcting. But you know who he reminds me of? Ralph Staten. Yeah, a little bit. Yep, yep, same size, speed, great speed. Ran a 10 8 8 100 meters in an official track meet last week, so that tells you what kind of ability he has. 37 tackles for losses last year, 11 and a half sacks. As you mentioned, Gary, he'll be an outside linebacker in college. He came down on a visit to Alabama a little over a week ago. Nick Saban told him he was going to offer him. Uh, Javier likes Alabama a whole lot, but he said he's keeping his options open. And, you know, some people out there, some Alabama fans say, well, this is from the same school that produced Jonathan Rose last year. He'll follow Jonathan Rose. Uh, coach Keith Etheridge, high school coach up there at Leeds, told me, he said, no, that's not the case at all. He's going to make his own decision. If you follow Alabama recruiting, you probably say every year, my goodness, they're recruiting more left tackles. Well, it's maybe the most difficult position to find good players at and players that you can project to be great players. So you have to take a lot of them in hopes of finding just a few that can play. Oliver Jones out of uh, South Carolina, another one of these big, tall, rangy guys that uh, you know, fits the profile right now. Visited Alabama over the weekend, Gary. Here's the thing about him. He's an intriguing prospect. You see his size there. He's got great athletic ability. He didn't play a down his junior year. He blew out his knee right before the season started, but he already has offers from South Carolina and Clemson. And if it had not been for that knee injury, he'd probably have a ton of offers. A lot of schools just want to see how he progresses this spring. Alabama is one of those schools. Oliver told me yesterday, he said, hey, 
If Alabama offers, it's going to make it very, very difficult for me. Let's skip ahead to 2013. That's the way recruiting's done these days. And we talked uh, for a year about Jadavion Clowney. What yep. a great prospect. Robert Kimdichi out of Loganville, Georgia, plays for former Tide player Mickey Kahn. This is Lorenzo Washington's high school. He's even a little bigger in terms of his body weight, but uh, you wrote a story on him. Kahn compares him favorably to Clowney, just says he's an unblockable defensive end. Well, Mickey Kahn told me that everybody that came there through there told, told him that as a sophomore, Kimdichi would have been the number two defensive end in the country behind Jadavion Clowney. That's how talented he is. Said he runs a 4-6-40. I mean, that's fast, but it's real fast for a guy 6'5", 275 pounds. So he's been a terror as a, as a sack-type pass rushing guy. And uh, Alabama, according to Mickey, Mickey Kahn right now, is, is uh, at the top of his list. One to keep an eye on. Well, up next, what one Auburn Internet reporter said about the recruitment of an Alabama signee. It's made big news. Plus, we'll get to your phone calls and emails. There's the number on the screen you need to get in touch with us. Stay with us. Tider Insider TV will continue right after this. Saturday, of course, is A Day, and uh, WVUA TV will have a special edition of Crimson Tide Kickoff live Saturday at noon. John Huddleston will join me. It's a, a special edition of our highly popular Crimson Tide Kickoff show from last fall. We'll do it this spring on uh, Saturday as well, so make sure and join us at 12 noon for that. Well, this past week, a reporter for AuburnSports.com made allegations surrounding the recruitment of Bama signee Brent Callaway. Writer Jeffrey Lee told a mobile radio station that Callaway received impermissible benefits from a person that was involved with the Alabama Athletics Department. The man in question was later identified as Darren Woodruff, the president of Petrochemical Energy. The university launched an immediate investigation into the matter and found that Woodruff did not graduate from Alabama nor has donated mon money to the Athletics Department and is not considered a booster. Lee also alleged that Callaway's adopted father, Peaches Winston, had received cash payments, but again, Lee offered no proof. Monday in Mobile, Nick Saban was asked about the matter. Well, you know, first of all, we want to do everything the right way, and, um, we, you know, our program has always been that way. That's something that we sort of pride ourselves in, and, you know, organizationally, I think we've done that pretty well, and uh, anytime there is some question about it, I think we have a compliance department that certainly does a great job of uh, helping us stay on the straight and narrow as well as checking out things that when they come up and they certainly did a good job of checking this out. We control what we do as a program. I think the thing that you can't control is how information gets out, who puts it out, the credibility of that information when it gets out and you know everybody responds to it so you know everything's pretty transparent. I think that part of it you can't control but you can't control what you do and you know what you do is more important who you are is more important than what you do um, and we try to do things the right way and today the young man in question brent calloway weighed in on a uh, interview with aaron suttles from the tuscaloosa news and tidesports.com we are going to read some of that interview on why he switched back to bama brent told aaron suttles i was like this is where i've got to be on top of that auburn signed three other running backs before i even signed they were misleading me very misleading on how many times Coach Doug Goodwin called in the weeks before signing day, Coach Goodwin was blowing up my phone, and when he found out that I was going to Alabama, it was like he started sending me crazier messages talking about I'm going to get in trouble. I was like, Coach Goodwin, nobody has paid me to do anything. He told my dad, it's a shame he forced me to go. I said, my dad can't force me to do nothing. Peaches is my guardian, and for that matter, he has limits on what he has say-so over. And college is not a say-so any parent has over his son or daughter. That's a decision they have to make. All right, Rodney, let me bring you in. We have talked about this before. It's just the way things are in this state. If something comes up with, with Auburn in terms of NCAA matters, you can bet there are going to be allegations thrown back at Alabama like clockwork. Jeffrey Lee, reporter for AuburnSports.com, threw out these allegations uh, using sources that certainly seem to be one-sided in their thought process. Just your, your opinion on all of this. Well, I mean, we talked about it. What, right after he made this announcement? Or not actually, that was signing day, but when he made his switch. And we said then, and again, it was nothing against D uh, Doug Goodwin, the high school coach at Russellville, but, you know, the sources were telling us that Brent was under extreme pressure by Coach Goodwin to switch his commitment to Auburn, that, that he was doing everything he could, Goodwin, to coerce Russell, uh, or rather Brent Calloway, to Auburn. So, again, I think that uh, when Brent spoke up today to uh, Aaron Suttles of Tidesports.com, he basically lined it out. Goodwin, the former coach at Demopolis, then at Russellville, now the new coach at Homewood High School, an Auburn graduate. 
And a lot has been made about him signing with Alabama after committing to Auburn. But one thing that doesn't get pointed out in these articles on AuburnSports.com is that he had been an Alabama commitment for well over a year before switching to Auburn. He switched out at the uh, Army All-American game in San Antonio, Texas when Coach Goodwin and others were out there. A couple of Auburn commitments uh, that he became very good friends with. And uh, so, you know, when that happened, where was the uproar from Alabama people? There really wasn't any, but when he switched back to Alabama, uh, now these, these allegations. But according to the university's own investigation, they are baseless. Well, and again, I think you made the, a great point, Gary. When you look at his recruitment, he committed to Alabama in the summer of 2009. He was very happy with that. Alabama was a school that he had developed a lot of relationships, not only with coaches, but current players here, very close to several of those guys. And, and then all of a sudden, after being committed to Alabama almost a year and a half, he commits to Auburn less than a month before signing day. So again, the, the fact that he switched back to Alabama is not a surprise to me. What surprised me was that he ever switch to Auburn. Well, you know, uh, you and I talk about it often. I don't like these he said, she said things. We don't get into a lot of these type discussions on our show uh, because everybody can throw out allegations. But certainly when it becomes a story like this involving an Alabama commitment, we have to talk about it. But our stance right now is Alabama has done an investigation, found nothing wrong, and we don't expect anything to come of it. Okay, let's go right to the phones. First up tonight, Joseph in Tuscaloosa. Joseph, welcome into the program. Hey, how you doing today, Gary? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, but hey, I need to ask you something. Now, is there, you think it's just the fact that Auburn is better because Brent Cowboy made a decision to come back to Alabama instead of Auburn? Joseph, I don't know if, you know, Auburn's bitter. Certainly there seem to be some people that uh, are bitter. You know, uh, the, the writer of this story certainly seems to have an axe to grind. Others that were involved uh, in the recruitment of Brent Cowboy. I, you know, I, coaches at college football are used to getting commitments at the last second and losing commitments. I can't speak for the Auburn coaches, but certainly there seem to be some uh, that are that are disappointed and uh, want to keep this in the news or at least make it in the news. Well, I, th I think the competition here now with Chiswick and his staff, Trooper Taylor, uh, Curtis Looper, certainly. I think that uh, with Nick Saban's reputation as a great recruiter, I think there's the competition, not that it's not always been high, but it may be at an all-time high in terms of recruit, recruiting. And a lot of guys at Alabama have recruited. Auburn's come after them. Look at Cyrus Quandro late in the process. Auburn had never been involved with Cyrus Quandro. Alabama had been considered the strong leader for over a year, and especially since Ari Quandro was here, his brother. And, and all of a sudden, within three weeks, the uh, last three weeks of the recruiting process, Auburn gets involved with Cyrus Quanjo. So, again, it's kind of a similar situation. And it works both ways. You know, you, you got Alabama getting Quanjo and getting Callaway, but losing Robinson Therese, a defensive back out of Florida that looked like uh, Alabama was his leader. Mm -hmm. He winds up signing with Auburn. The difference was somebody from an Alabama website, website didn't go out and, and write a story about Robinson Therese going to, uh, to Auburn instead of Alabama. But there are hit and misses on both sides, and there always will be. Yep. That's right. That's just the way it is. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk with Trey in West Block. And Trey, welcome in. Hey, how are y'all doing? Doing well. Yeah, I was wondering about um, Doral, Doriel, Doriel, who knows? Doriel, Doriel know. Green Beckham. And from uh, Missouri, who could, you know, I guess at least plausibly, he could ultimately be just the number one overall player, at least according to some out that's in the class of 2012. And he's kind of like a taller version of Julio, slightly taller version mm -hmm. from what I've seen. What exactly is his interest level in Bama at this point? Well, that's a good question, Trey. And, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk to his legal guardian, who happens to be the head football coach there at Springfield, Missouri High School, John Beckham. And they came on a visit here a couple of weeks ago. He had an opportunity to watch Alabama practice. From everything I've gathered, he had an extremely good visit to Alabama. He has a significant interest in Alabama, and that's even according to Coach Beckham. So, again, I think Alabama has a great chance right now. But it, it's very early. He's being recruited, as you mentioned, from coast to coast. Has offers from all the major powers. Oklahoma is a school that's, you know, relatively close, I guess, by where he lives. So again, I think there's going to be a lot of competition for Doriel Green Beckham. But Alabama is certainly a school that's in the mix right now. All right, more phone calls and emails. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Hey, if you want the finest in menswear, like the original elephant where go to the locker room on the University Strip, a Tuscaloosa tradition since 1964. I've got my original elephant wear shirt on. You've got your original elephant wear tie on. They've got all the original elephant wear gear, but much more. The finest in suits, sports coats, outerwear. It's the locker room in Tuscaloosa on the University Strip, a tradition for a long time, since 1964, right here in Tuscaloosa. Let's go back to the phones and talk with uh, James in Rainbow City. James, welcome into the program. Hey, y'all guys. Hey, good, good James. Hope to see y'all Saturday. Uh, now that this year has been brought up about this talk about Cowboy, I think mainly what's going on there is 
people are jealous that Alabama has, has, has a tradition of winning, and I believe they stand a good chance of probably making a run at the national championship mm-hmm. again. And we got great coaches and great players, and that's what it really boils down to. But my question was, do you think there's going to be a battle for the quarterback clean into the first two or three games of the season? James, good, good question. I, you know, I think it's going to go right up until – the, the season, probably the first week, but I don't think there'll be any controversy once the season starts. Now, does that mean that they may just play one quarterback? I don't know. They could play both, but I think Saban will have a plan and have it announced before that first ball game. I don't think he wants this going two, three, four games and not knowing what the quarterback situation well, is. Well, I think that comment you had earlier from Mo Bill, he also had a comment during that interview that both quarterbacks were considered starters. And I think that's a significant comment because I think they're both pretty equal. I think Alabama could probably – certainly win with both guys and, and, and both have looked outstanding at times in the scrimmages and throughout the spring. So again, Alabama's in a great position. I've said this many times before. I thought that Alabama, in terms of quarterback, has not had this much talent at one time in many years. Hey, Bart, we're up against the clock. Go real quick, my man. Uh, what time is the AA game? Well, the AA game's at 2. Yeah, best time to go, probably, I would say, get here by noon because there's going to be a lot of festivities. Between 12 and 1, they're going to unveil the new statue. So, uh, so get here a little early, maybe even earlier than that. But the game is at 2 o'clock. Stick around. An update on the Alabama baseball and softball teams when Tider Insider TV returns. Alabama baseball trying to get back on the winning track, doing it so far. Top of the fourth, they lead Mississippi Valley State 4 to nothing. Softball trying to do the same thing, winning at Troy 4 to 2 in the bottom of the third. Well, it is dinner time tonight. We're headed over to see our good friends at the Pottery Grill in Northport, and uh, we invite you to come out and join us for dinner. People have been doing that, been coming out, and we're talking football and, and whatever else. If you come out to the Pottery Grill, you can meet us there. And a reminder that you can catch the show anytime you want on our website, WVUA. TV.com. We'll also have a replay tonight here on the TV station at 1035. So for Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Thanks for watching Tider Insider TV. We'll see you next week.